welcome to our Jesuit University and more especially to this um, open lecture. So be at home. Here at Arupe is a home and I'm sure you're, you will cherish being here at Arupe. Of our time, may I call upon um, the Dean of the School of Education and Leadership, Dr. Nzioki, to give us a short address. Good afternoon. <laughs> when I was asked to give this opening, of this opening in a few words, I wondered to myself what I would say since we have an expert in the house. But then I thought to myself that probably just to lay the ground to see, to prepare the ground for what we are hoping to hear. And I thought I would I'll begin this way. If I asked all of us here, who a leader is, <coughs> I would probably get as many definitions and descriptions as the number of people here. But if I asked what makes a good leader, I would probably get a smaller number as we all try to think, to process in our minds, and narrow down to the things that mark a leader who stands out. Who is a transformational leader? What do they do? How do they lead? What do they aim to achieve? Transformative leadership requires the leader to have a clear sense of the values and benefits that undergird his or her own identity, to be willing to take stands that may require moral courage, to live in tension, and to some degree to engage in activism and advocacy. Um, I would like to recognize the Dean, Dean of the uh, Faculty of uh, Education and Leadership, and also say all critical observed challenges women face in leadership role, these I can easily relate to because I've been through that road. Strategies women have used to advance their careers. Well, I don't know about women in general, but I can confidently talk about the strategies that I have used and I have known uh, women in similar roles to have used. Obviously, I'll talk my personal experiences based on the um, highlights from my CV that you read to see talk about. And then what I think needs to be done to encourage more women to get involved in leadership. So I'll start from um, the current state of women in leadership. Like I said, I don't, I'm not a fundi in terms of the literature on this, but what I gleaned is that, and I, I can relate to that, that while women have made a lot of significant inroads in terms of entry into organizations, into managerial uh, ranks of the organization, that organizational environment is still very much dominated by men. I think most people would agree that while women have made inroads into the organization, the environment in the uh, organizational workplace is still very much dominant. And this has a bearing on what I'm going to say later on, the characteristic of the environment within the organization. Just to share some statistics from a study I stumbled on, uh, which was looking at women in management and leadership roles worldwide. It was talking about women in management worldwide, uh, the, their share of managerial positions ranged between 20 and 40 percent in 48 of the 63 countries that were covered in the survey. So it's a very low proportion. Look, this is a worldwide global statistic. And disappointingly, there is very little current and hard data on female managers in Africa. So Dean, I will challenge you that this is an area that we need to focus on and gather more information so that strategies can be informed from that research in terms of how do we tackle this problem. So having painted that picture of what women uh, occupy what role and how, you know, how few they are in Africa, let me then move on to what are some of the barriers 
that have um, adversely impacted on the women's advancement in leadership position. One can categorize these barriers into three. There are social barriers, there are organizational barriers, and there are also individual barriers, barriers at individual level, that is the woman herself, or individual at society level, our individuals in society. So, on social barriers, we're talking about the socialization process of the girl child, which is rooted in cultural and social traditions, which emphasize the primary role of women as mothers, as wives, and we can relate to that because until recently, inheritance laws in Zimbabwe it would not allow the girl child to be married. It was always, even if you are the oldest the girl, the inheritance was for the young brother. So that just speaks to you in terms of the attitudes and perceptions. There is also a gender stereotyping. This is some of the problem. Women are generally perceived as less competent, often subjected to higher standards of performance. In the workplace, we have uh, experienced that. As a woman, you actually have to prove yourself you know, you are guilty before proven innocent. Whereas with guys, the assumption is they can do it. So they are generally accepted. But as a woman, you are looked at with suspicion to them, really, can you do it? So you really have to now work extra mile to demonstrate that, yes, I can do it. So you have to work extra hard in order to deal and address that stereotype. Generally, in Zimbabwean society is very, still very much patriar patriarchal. patriarchal. Married women feel constrained by social norms, like I said, and it's difficult to participate in informal networks. And yet informal networks at those levels are really very important because that's where serious issues decision. When you, by the time you get to the boardroom, a decision has already been made because people are playing golf together, people were drinking together. So no matter how much you argue, no matter how reasonable you are, you know, your contribution is. A decision has already been made, unfortunately. And you are not part of that self. Women generally, we are not very assertive. We don't, um, we don't, we are not aggressively pushing our agenda at our point. We give up too easily. Whereas men will argue and press for what they want until they get it. So that lack of assertiveness, aggression, competitiveness, Killer instinct, in some cases, will make people think she's not hungry for that position. What I discovered is that uh, when a position, high level position comes up, you may have the same level of skill or even better. Guys are very quick to say, how can you do it? Even if they have no clue. <laughs> At individual level, you must have a good work ethic, especially as a woman. Because remember what I said, you must work twice as hard more than the male can. So for you to stand up, your work ethic must be very good. And people are quick to say, you see, what can you expect from women? So you are trying to avoid that. So you really need to apply yourself. Be part of professional bodies and social networks that add value. When you are on WhatsApp, ask yourself, what am I doing? What are you reading? What are you spending most of the time doing? Get, leave those groups when you realize they are not adding value. Otherwise, we get sucked into spending, you know, before you know it, an hour have gone, what are you reading? So, be part of those networks that help you really go forward. You mentioned that um, sometimes women do not, um, are not in solidarity with one another. <laughs> Have you any thoughts about what is possible in terms of just encouraging that solidarity? Women by nature, we love attention. <laughs> we love attention. So if there are more of us that are going to get that attention, obviously, it's not a good thing. 
So naturally in us, I think we're looking for the attention seeking behavior. So it's competitiveness and also attention seeking. What should we do to encourage that? I think if it's a work set up or environment, and, um, and yeah, I'm not theorizing, <laughs> it's things that we have actually experienced. When, when um, a boss has realized that there's tension between so and so, sometimes they send us on a business trip together <laughs> for one week. So during that time, you get to understand and discover each other. And in the end, by the time you come back, you now have discovered common areas and common interests. So it takes the person who is trying to work with you together to notice that there is a problem here and ensure that they create a work setup that forces you to do that. You talked about uh, the preferences that are given between uh, boys and girls in terms of education. And you also went through that. And I also remember when you shared that, that your uncle was also asking, why are you wasting time taking this girl child to school? How did you manage to overcome that as a person, as an individual, and also as a family? Because I think the root cause of all what we are talking about here in terms of women leadership is emanating from socialization, which you also have highlighted in your presentation. It's about socialization, the patriarchal society which we are living in. Obviously, it hurts, and you, coming from an elderly person that you're looking up to, you almost like feel my world has come to the end now, collapse. Um, but in this particular case, it was not about what I did to manage that. It was really about having an understanding mother who was on my side and saying, look, don't listen to what they are saying. I mean, let's just continue. It's as if to say, look, let's do what we can do within our resources. It's not like we're going to be asking them to use their money. So it was their support, supportive parent who ensured that despite what was being said around us, she stood by me and ensured that. So she was my pillar of strength in that, in that regard.